Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, just ask that your spirit will just move in our hearts and show us the context of what your word is and show us what you're doing in the church and show us your love and how we should relate to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you read Matthew 18, there's a whole bunch of little passages there. And I'd like to go through each one just in, in summary form before we try to hit the passage that we're actually going to look at. Um, the first passage, the first few verses there, talks about what well, Jesus asks the disciples. He says, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Little children. Right, it talks about the little children. And then after that, he talks about causing these little children to stumble, right? And, and he gives a little caution there. He says, don't make them stumble because if you make them stumble, and it's better to have a millstone hung around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to make these little children stumble, right? Okay, you remember that? So there's a little caution that Jesus gives there. Don't make them stumble. Now it's not talking about, you know, tripping them physically, right? It's talking about what? The next passage, we'll talk about, it's a parable, it's the parable of the lost sheep. Now how many sheep were lost in that flock? One. One. Out of how many? One hundred, right. And how many did he leave, leave behind to find that one? Ninety-nine. So you see the attitude of God. God's willing to leave the ninety-nine just to look for that one. All right. And when that one person stumbles, he's going to go look for that one. Right? So stumbling has nothing to do with tripping. It's not physical. It's it's more of a person does something wrong and you caused it. I caused it. I caused you to stumble. I caused you to do something wrong. Maybe I caused you to sin. Or maybe I caused you to do something outside of your conscience. Now, what's amazing about this particular parable is that God is saying, be careful, because I am their provider. I am their protector. I will go out of my way to go look for that one person. And other times we just apply that particular passage to one lost sheep, meaning someone who has not accepted Jesus Christ. But in the context of this particular chapter, he's talking about our relationship with one another. Talking about our relationship with children. Maybe also talking about our relationship with the younger believers. Or maybe talking about our relationship with believers who we think know less than we do. And he says, I'm their protector. I'm the background, not just the back, not just the historical background. What we want to see is the mood behind this particular chapter. And there's one other passage at the end of um, the one that we're going to look at, which starts in verse 21. There's a story about Peter asking Jesus and saying, and asking, um, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. What does that mean? Don't stop ever. Don't stop ever. Now, 70 times 7 is how many? 490. 490, if you got a mathematician here. Okay. <laughs> 490. In fact, in this particular um, slide here, it looks like 70 raised to the 7th power, which is not 70 times 7, but 70 times 70 times 70. Now, whatever. Has anyone ever offended you 490 times in one day? <laughs> Never? Please raise your hand. If someone has offended you 490 times in one day. Steve, right? <laughs> 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 
it's amazing. If someone offends you 490 times and you have to forgive it 490 times in one day, how can you remember that many saints? Now you can't even remember that. Exactly. All right, kid. Okay. This is the 489 times that you offended me. I'm gonna forgive you one more time, and then that's it. But God doesn't mean 490 times, right? He means something else. He means more than 490. In fact, what He wants is, He wants us to forgive always. Right? Always forgiving. Amen. And He tells a story about the, the, um, one of His um, servants who owed Him a big sum of money. And He was going to put Him in jail. And His family. So that He can pay. And how can you pay someone when you're, when you're in jail? Right? But he says, please, help me out on this one. Right? Uh, please, give me some time and I'll pay you up. And he says, well, the master says, well, I gave you a second thought and no, you don't have to pay me. He didn't even ask for amnesty. He asked for time. And yet the master gave him total amnesty. Forgave his debt. Totally. And what did he do after that? He found his fellow servant who owed him just a little bit, maybe a hundred bucks. He says, I'll put you in jail if you don't pay me that hundred bucks. And the guy said, give me some time, I'll pay you back. And this servant says, no, I'm, I'm putting you and your family in jail. And all the other servants heard about this and reported to the master. And the master said, all right, you did that to your fellow servant, I'll do it to you too. I'll put you in the jail, along with your family. So, the message is, forgive always. Forgive always. I mean, no exception, unless you want to be the exception. Right? Because God wants to forgive. But, but this, the message is always forgive. Now, what, what we're going to do is take that and try to understand this particular passage in verses uh, 15 to 20, which talks about what most of us think is about discipline. So when your brother or your sister sins against you, what do you do? So if you read the entire chapter, you get, you get a mood. You, you get this feeling from God that, you know, this is not about discipline. It's more about forgiveness. It's more about taking care of your brother. It's more about making sure they don't stumble. It's more about making sure they don't trip. And that you don't teach them to do something that's wrong. It's all about your relationship with your brother and sister. It's not about discipline in the church. Well, let's start with verse 15. So if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Amen. I wish all relationships would just end right there. And we won't need to read verse 16 all the way down to verse 20. Well, most relationships don't. So let's ask the question, what do you mean sin? And in the King James, it talks about sinning against you. If your brother or sister sins or offends you or sins against you. Now, we can ask the question, what is sin? Is it breaking a law and therefore he sinned and you saw him? Gamble, or maybe go to a brothel, or maybe get drunk, or something. If your brother sins against you, is that against you? Or are we talking about offenses here? <coughs> maybe it's offense. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe he did something that he shouldn't have done. Right? I don't want to talk
title at this point, but more of, let's leave it at that. Could be an offense against you, or it could be something that you think is wrong, and that he sinned against God, and therefore you've got this righteous indignation against this person. Right? Because we're all there, right? Sometimes we look at another person and we've got all kinds of rules and regulations and sometimes it's not right. Sometimes really it's not biblical, but we determine in our hearts and our minds that a Christian needs to do this and if he doesn't do this, then he's sinning. Amen? That's where most of us are. Regardless of what the scripture actually says. So let's, let's go to where we are. Let's say you see that brother or sister sin. Or let's say you see that brother or sister offend you. Or offend your sensibilities. Like way back then, we used to think that eating pork was wrong. And so if someone ate pork, we were offended. Right? Offense. Uh, good. We don't do that now, so I can eat pork. <laughs> And shrimp. And crab, my favorite. <laughs> it says, if your brother or sister sins or offends you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Does it say, go and tell another brother or sister Amen. and talk about that person? Amen. Amen. Right? Not, that's not the case here. It says, talk between you and him or her. Yep. Just the two of you. Amen. Amen. Can you go look at your the person next to you and go, you know, uh, hit him with your hit him or her with your what do you call that? Elbow. <laughs> Elbow. That's right. Okay. Sorry, it's not my English. <clears throat> Elbow that person. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won. How does it feel like to win someone over? Great. Feels great, right? So stop talking to the other people about that person and go talk to that person. Just between you and him or her. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. And I hear a bigger amen. 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 Verse 16. But if they will not listen, unfortunately, things happen and they... You know, you can't convince the other person. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay, question. Why take one or two others along? One is, we can look at this and say that, is there another witness? Okay. Or we can look at this and say, well, let's have one advocate for each person. Or, on the other hand, we can, we can bring in people who are neutral. Who are neutral and listen to the arguments on both sides and determine, based on the Word of God, whether which one is right, Amen. who's right, Amen. or who's wrong. Maybe sometimes it's just a perception. I see someone, I see you doing this, and I, I'm thinking in my mind, he's doing wrong. He just did, he just... Maybe someone said something that you mistook, you misunderstood, and so you come to that person and say, you said this, you said that, you did that, he said, no, I didn't say that, no, I didn't do that, and so you bring in a couple more people to establish truth, and all you need to do is step one, just talk to the person. Love each other and take it to God. Yeah, take it to God. Remember, 70 times 7. Remember, you love your brother. You, you, and, and if you think you have this righteous indignation and you're, you know better than this other person, so who's the younger brother then? The one that knows better. The one that knows better is the younger brother? The one that has the sense to live it all. Remember, the older brother is always the one who is pointing fingers at the end of the world. All the time. All the time. So watch out. God is protecting the younger brother. Amen. And we, we always have that righteous indignation thinking that we're, 
And really, we're the older brother when it comes to that. Verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, and I have not, in my whole life, never gotten to the place where verse 17 actually happened. Yeah. And someone, someone came to me before uh, in our church plant back in the Philippines, and this woman, oh, bless this woman, um, and she's one of the leaders in the church, and she says, you know, you need to talk to that one other leader who comes into church, but well, we had a very casual church. So dress code was, there was no dress code. She would come in short shorts. <laughs> she was one of the most, you know, loving persons in the church. She came in short shorts, but she loved everyone. She cared for a lot of people. She would go and, and volunteer in, in urban ministry, be there with the poor and carry those smelly kids in her arms. She, she, you know, she, as far as being Christ-like, except for the short shorts. <laughs> Man, I looked up to her. I was the pastor, but I looked up to her. And she had some amazing gifts too, spiritual gifts. But this other woman who was also a leader, she came to me and said, you got to tell that other leader, um, stop wearing short shorts. It offends me. And my quick answer was, based on Matthew 18, I think you need to talk to her. Because you haven't done that part. You haven't done that part. So she went, she followed that, she went, Matthew 18. They talked. I never heard anything about that issue again. Now, she would wear short shorts to um, the squatters, the urban poor. But in church, she would start. She started wearing jeans, right? Once in a while. <laughs> if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Now, who's the church? God. We are the church. Can you talk, see the person next to you and 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 say, "We are the church." God. We are the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, there are some groups that think that the church is the pastor, or the leadership, or all the elders. That's not true. In this particular context here, remember this. Jesus talking about the church. Where was the church back then? Everywhere. With the disciples, there were just 12 of them. And some of the other disciples, they probably didn't even have that word, ecclesia. Who was the church back then? Now, when this was written, this was probably written at least 15 years later, and so they had a term for church, and they had church. Now, churches back then, they were small. They met in homes. They didn't have buildings like, like we did. They didn't have the hierarchy that we did. So who was the church? And when Paul wrote to the, to the churches in, in Corinth and in Ephesus and all the other churches there, who did he write to? All the believers. All the believers in that particular city. He didn't even write elders. So who's the church? And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Now, how did Jesus treat the tax collectors? He ate with them. Huh? He ate with them. He ate with them. He ate with the tax collectors. Now, how would you treat an IRS tax collector? Invite them to your house, right? So we can talk about my problem. This is not talking about the disfellowshipping. Come on. This is not talking about that. Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, granted, the Jews treated the pagans like dirt. But he's not talking to Jewish Christians. The writer is talking to Jewish Christians. And he, he says, Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, Jews would treat pagans like, hey, I can't fellowship with you, I can't eat with you, I won't give you the right hand of fellowship. But now, a Jewish Christian, 
uh, treat pagans as a child of God. At least they don't know that, or a future child of God. You need to teach, uh, treat tax collectors as Jesus treated tax collectors. Yeah. Verse 19, again truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, the context is about disputes among brothers and sisters. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Now, this is the key. When we talk with every brother or sister, remember that there's a third person there with you. In fact, Christ in you and Christ in your brother or your sister. You've got to remember that. Because Jesus is protector. He's the one that looks after the lost sheep. He is in your brother or your sister. And you can't dismiss that. you got to treat your brother or your sister with love, mercy, and compassion. Hmm. Amen. So the caution is, God is present in our midst and in each of us. Amen? Amen. So let me just cap this. This is not about discipline. This is about relationships within, between brother and sister. Hmm. And we need to remember, if you think you know better, then treat your brother or your sister as a child of God, a younger brother, someone that you need to love and care for. Now, if that person did something wrong, please go talk to that person with love, understanding, Amen. mercy, compassion. Don't come to me. Because I'm going to send you to your brother or your sister. It should stop there. God loves each one of us. That's the point. God loves you. God loves me. God loves your brother and your sister. And He wants all of us to love and care for each other. So as the song goes, He ain't heavy. He's my brother. He's my brother. My brother.